attention to at this time. I'd like to greet all of you with the peace and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad to see all of you. Lots of young people, children. <clears throat> we are glad to welcome all of those who are joining uh, via live stream. I know at least one person who would have liked to be here, but from uh, health reasons, it's not. And many others who live far and can't come every Sabbath, and those who are from different parts of this country or some other parts of this globe. Today I'd like us to make one step further in our studies about Joseph. Uh, do you like the story of Joseph? Thank you. Last time if you remember, those of you who were in church, or that have watched online, you remember we talked about because he was faithful and he stood firm for the principles of God. He ended up in prison. He was accused falsely. He didn't hire an attorney to defend his case. He didn't uh, protest, but at that age, when he was 27 years old, he was put in prison. And most of the time we have this understanding that in prison, Joseph was always the supervisor, you know, like he was in charge of the prisoners. But if you pay attention to the introductory verse, which is from Psalm 105, Psalm tells us that life was not so sweet in the beginning. It gives us some details and elements. This is Psalm 105, 17 to 19. Let us read once again. These were the introductory verses. Psalm 105, 17 to 19. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. He, see, the life of Joseph goes around many tests. And don't you think that our life or your life is excused or is bypassed by tests? Okay, so he passed several tests, and the, the last one before he ended up in prison was the test of fidelity. Now, he, when he was put in prison, we can see that his feet were put in shekels in iron, and he was not having such a great time. That was a prison. Although these were the prisoners who were around Pharaoh and his generals, it was not a regular prison, it was a, a special prison, but still, they were put in iron, their feet. We, we know that being falsely accused, Potiphar's wife used his robe to cover her sin. And but he, so far he lost two robes. The first robe he was stripped when he came to see his brothers. And they tried to cover their sin. And the second time he lost his robe when Potiphar's wife stripped him because she wanted something and he didn't agree. So he lost two robes so far. And what's interesting, if you pay attention, the first one was taken by his brothers, by the Jews. And the second one was taken by a Gentile woman. Which means that Christ's robe can cover Jews and Gentiles. 
being in prison, something had to keep him alive. I don't know if you ever thought, but when somebody does something good, when you are faithful to God and you end up bad, when you try to be faithful, when you try to stick by the word of God and fulfill the principles which we find in the Bible, and then eventually you are treated wrongly, you are falsely accused, and you are put in jail. Did you think about that? How will your faith react? How will your life react to such a treatment? Uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Apostle Paul gives us some instructions. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. This is what kept Joseph to go on, to not drop his hands, but keep going. Although his feet were in iron, he didn't have a decent, never mind, comfortable life in prison. He had to go on. And uh, in the Gospel of John, verse uh, 33, chapter 16, we are instructed. This is John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Christ didn't promise an easy. He says, in me you'll have peace. As Joseph had peace in the Lord Jesus. But in this world you, you will have tribulations. You will have persecution. People will hate you. People will be against you. Why? Because you stood for the truth. I, I like this paragraph. It comes from Conflict and Courage, page 76. Joseph's faithful integrity led to the loss of his reputation and his liberty. This is the severest test that the Virtuous and God-fearing are subjected, subjected to, that vice seems to prosper while virtue is trampled in the dust. Joseph's religion kept his temper sweet and his sympathy with humanity warm and strong, notwithstanding all his trials. No sooner does he enter upon prison life than he brings all the brightness of his Christian principles into active exercise. He begins to make himself useful to others. He is cheerful, for he is a Christian gentleman. Now let me ask you, are you a Christian gentleman like was Joseph? God was preparing him under this discipline for a situation of great responsibility, honor, and usefulness, and he was willing to learn. He took kindly to the lessons the Lord would teach him. He learned to bear the yoke in his youth. He learned to govern by first learning obedience himself. So when you look at this situation with Joseph, he was faithful to God, and now he is treated unfairly. Now he ended up in prison for his faithfulness. And you might say and ask, where is God? God was with Joseph. You will see, God was with Joseph. In many situations, you have questioned you, and you ask, and you say, well, God, why did you allow that person to get cancer? God, why did you allow in that family that accident? Why did you allow the house to be burned down? And God says, I am there. In 
In James 1, 3, the Bible says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Joseph has learned many lessons so far. He was tried in different situations with his brothers, leaving the homeland, going to Egypt, being sold as a slave, being treated unfairly. And now another test comes, <clears throat> being in prison. Now how is life in prison? Let us go to Genesis chapter 40. We would like to look into this story closer. We are in Genesis chapter 40, verse 1 to verse 4. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in word in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in a in word. So what happens behind the scenes? Probably, you know, as most of the kings and Pharaoh had his butler and his baker, you know, who were supposed to bring the right wine and the right food, bread, before Pharaoh. So probably there was an attempt to assassinate Pharaoh. And before this case was cleared, he didn't choose, well, it's the baker or it's the butler. He put two of them in prison, in jail. And this was the captain jail. This was a special jail. So both of them were thrown in prison for an unspecified period of time. So who was in prison? Well, in the beginning, Joseph was, his feet were in shekels. He was treated as all of those prisoners. But then after a while, we find here in, in Genesis 4, the Bible says that Joseph was entrusted to oversee or to be, how, how, how it says here, The captain of the guard put Joseph in charge over all the prisoners that were in that prison. Well, when you think about that prison, you should not imagine that this was something, you know, like very fancy. Probably it was a, a hole in the ground and covered, you know, and so, so it was some kind of cell where, where these prisoners were kept. And Joseph was taking care of them. See, with Joseph, you put him down and he comes up. You try to put him in prison and now he is entrusted to oversee all the prisoners. Why? Because God was with Joseph. If God is with you, even in prison, God will work out miracles. I'll quote quite a bit from this book, God Sent a Man, page 96, by Carlisle B. Haynes. And at this page he says, the arrival of these two notable prisoners meant much to Joseph, even before they had their significant dreams. They had moved in court circles. They knew what went on in the country. They were intimate with the great man of the nation, familiar with its statesmen, its courtiers, courtiers, its military men, its priests and scientists, all of whom frequently the co frequented the court of Pharaoh. In his daily intercourse with this man, Joseph had opened to him opportunity for gaining information of a valuable nature information that he put to good use when he later joined court circles. 
Don't forget, Joseph was a smart guy. He was not only smart, he was sharp, he was intelligent, he looked good. He had all of them. You say, God, how can you bless this young fellow? How old was Joseph when he ended up in prison? 27 years old. 27 years old. And now he is looking, he is watching over all of his prisoners. And he is taking opportunity when one day the, the door opens and two guys are pushed in. The butler and the baker. And Joseph has to take care of them as well. Probably they were talking among themselves and they were telling him stories. They, they were sharing some information, valuable information for Joseph. Joseph didn't know what God had in store. Joseph didn't know that from the worst, God can turn into the best. From a prison cell, he can end up into a royal palace. He didn't have a clue. But Joseph had a dream. Same book, page 95. Joseph could not possibly know what bearing on his own future welfare of these two men would have. It was not with that in mind that he showed them kindness and in, endeavored to alleviate their gloom. But with their gloom, a fateful development in Joseph's career had arrived. Now, one day something will happen. We don't know for how long. These two prisoners were kept in prison, but not more than one year. Following what it says here in chapter 40, Genesis 40, verse 5, it says, And they dreamed they dream both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them. And behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the word of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretation belong to God interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup in, into Pharaoh's hand. He was very enthusiastic. They come to Joseph, but notice something. Although Joseph was a prisoner himself, he was not indifferent to other people's troubles. I don't know myself, if I was in that situation, I don't know how would you behave. Oh, now I'm in this trouble. God has forgotten me. Shall I ask them what's wrong? Why they are sad? Shall I inquire of their life and perplexity? I have enough myself. No, Joseph was a different character. He forgot himself and he looked and he approached me and said, Gentlemen, what happened? Why your faces are sad? And we said, We had dreams last night. But there is no one, we don't know the interpretation. They, they were in turmoil, they were devastated. And he said, Well, isn't, is it, isn't there God who can give the interpretation? Tell them to me. I'd like you to notice something. When Joseph will give the interpretation to these two, to the butler and to the baker, and when Joseph will give the interpretation to Pharaoh later on, 
He will give the interpretation right away. Not like in the case of Daniel. Daniel asked for time and he went and prayed. Notice something. To Joseph, God will give the interpretation right away. And the butler said, look, this happened. I had the wine in my hand and I had the Pharaoh's cup and I was serving. And to make a long story short, you, you, know, you know it very well how, how it goes. So what was the interpretation? Now, now Joseph says, look, in three days, Pharaoh will release you and you are going to be restored in your office. <laughs> when the baker heard it, he said, sir, now, now my dream, my dream is coming. And, and Joseph said, go ahead, go ahead. The chief, verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I like this guy. <laughs> he gives good, good forecast, right? Like good um, uh, future. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of Bake meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. So notice, there is a persistency of three days here, right? So three days for the butler and three days for the baker. He says, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. Joseph was not afraid to speak the truth. And this truth he had to tell to the baker was not good news. He was going to die. He says in three days. The butler will be restored, uh, restored into his position. And Pharaoh are going, is going to take off your head. He is going to hang your body. And then the birds will eat your body. When the butler, when the baker heard it, probably said, well, I don't believe anymore in these dreams, you know. But unfortunately, this was true. This is what happened. In the same book, God sent a man, page 99, the interpreter of God has always a task of the highest importance. But it is not always a pleasant task. Sometimes it brings heartbreak. He does not always have good news to tell. There are times when it is the announcement of coming doom. When Jonah was sent to Nineveh, was he very happy to go there? That was a message of doom and gloom. Fire is coming. The city is going to be destroyed. How was Joseph? In what situation was Joseph placed? Well, you're going to leave, and he's going to die in three days. Three days only. Verse 20, Genesis 14. And it came to pass the third day. Which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Probably when, when he was leaving the, the dungeon, when he was about to go and being reinstored in his position, Joseph said, look, I am here, but I, I'm not guilty. I, I'm a Jew. I'm not even an Egyptian. I was sold as a slave. I served my servant, but hey, happened. You know, I was accused. But please, you, you are close to Pharaoh. You know very well those people. You know Pharaoh. Please, can, can you say something? How many times, brethren, 
And be honest with yourself. How many times when somebody did a good thing to you, maybe the person didn't ask to be remembered, didn't ask for any, didn't have any requests, but you just turned around, left through the door, and that moment you forgot of your benefactor. That moment you forgot the kindness, the diligence, the help, the support. How many times? And this is the case with Joseph. He revealed him the interpretation and he revealed him bad good news to the butler. He turns around, he forgot. Was Joseph upset on him? We don't have the record. Same book, God sent a man. Let us not blame the chief butler over much for forgetting the man in the prison who had shown him kindness and given him hope. It is a very human failing. We would do well before lashing out at the chief butler to recall some of our own lapses of memory. It was easy for the cupbearer to allow Joseph to slip out of his world of thoughts. Probably when he saw himself back reinstored in his position, he saw Pharaoh and he saw his daily business, he totally forgot about Joseph. But there was a plan. Why would not Joseph be re released if he would tell Pharaoh right then? Well, my personal opinion as I read the Bible is, Joseph was not ready for the next step. He had to learn one more lesson. So, 27 years old, he ends up in prison. And you know how many years he is in prison? Three years. When he's 30 years old, something will happen. Two more years, brethren, two more years, the butler totally forgot about Joseph. Total ignorance. Two more years. And Joseph had to do his daily routine. He had to do it faithfully as he did before. No, he would have complained that, Lord, how come I did, I was kind to this man, to the butler. And look what he pays it back. I like this statement. <clears throat> Carlisle behind says, Haynes says, the more faithfully he served God, the worse it had been for him. Do, do you agree so far? The more faithfully Joseph served God, the worse was for him. In a way, you know. Ended up in prison. Now he is forgotten. And he was serving God. You know, we sometimes can be in the same trap to complain. I, I have heard some individuals, you know, saying, well, how come, you know, I, I'm trying to live a healthy life. I'm trying to be faithful and look, I've got this disease. I, I, I'm in that trouble. And look, somebody is an alcoholic. Somebody is smoking. Somebody is using drugs. Somebody is doing this and that. And they are prospering. People and we are tempted to say, but Joseph was a different character. Now come with me to chapter 41 in Genesis. And we can see that the time was approaching when the Lord was going to fulfill Joseph's dreams. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, they ca there came up out of the river seven well favored kine and fat flesh that they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill, favored, and lean fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill favored and lean fleshed kine did eat up the seven well favored and fat kine. So Potiphar awoke. Uh, sorry, uh, Pharaoh, awoke from his sleep by this dream. And there was another dream exactly the same, about seven grain 
And, uh, you know, the fat ones and the uh, skinny ones, the skinny ones ate the fat ones. You know what he did first when, when he had these two dreams? We read in chapter 41, verse 8. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Whom did he call for interpretation? His astrologers, his magicians, his wise men, his science people. All of his people came and he said, look, these are the dreams. This is not the case of Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't even remember the dream. He said, look, two dreams. You tell me the interpretation. Well, how can they give the interpretation if they didn't give him the dream? And brethren, notice something. Sometimes we take the scripture and we try to give the interpretation with the human worldly knowledge and philosophy. And it's wrong. Why do we do that? To understand the Bible, we need the Spirit of God who has inspired those who wrote the Bible. And that's the case with Pharaoh. He was trying to get the interpretation from a wrong source. And now watch something. The butler, two years later, when, when he, he, he was among these people, he was bringing wine daily. To, to Pharaoh. And when he heard the dream. And he said wait a minute. There was a Hebrew slave. In that dungeon. How could I forget about him. His name was Joseph. And he goes to Pharaoh. And says Pharaoh. I know someone. Look when I was in, in jail. I had a dream. And the baker had a dream. And this guy. Told us the interpretation. And it was fulfilled. Now probably Pharaoh was puzzled and said, wait a minute, all of my wise men, all of my magicians, they couldn't say a word? Now do you think this Hebrew slave, he knows it? But he gave it a try. I like, I like this text from Proverbs 22, 29. It says, Seest thou a man, man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Joseph was one of them. Verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And he gives the talk. Then Pharaoh, verse 14, sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came into, in unto Pharaoh. Very important lesson here. I know the time is running out, but I'd like to make a few points. So did Joseph how he was? Because for three years in jail, I, I don't think he had shaving machines and stuff, you know, to take care. So he was how he was, you know, in, in, in those circumstances. But when Pharaoh sent word and a, somebody to call Joseph out of the dungeon, what did he do first? And I must tell you that the Egyptians, they were very much freaks about their etiquette and about their hygiene and how they looked, the Egyptians. So they had to be shaved and, you know, very neat and clean and everything, especially he was going before Pharaoh. So Joseph took time. He didn't know what it's all about. He took time. He shaved himself. He washed himself. He, he put in a new rope, you know, everything. He goes before Pharaoh. I like... How, uh, how, how Haynes says, among other things that Joseph had learned in his association with the officers of the Pharaoh was that court etiquette demanded perfect cleanliness and propriety of dress. In the minds of Egyptians, these were of such importance that otherwise important matters could be postponed until these were in order. 
If this was when you appear in front of an earthly king, how do we present ourselves when we come before a heavenly king? So Joseph, after three years in the dungeon, could calmly refuse to be heard even by an imperative summons of the king until he had shaved himself and obtained and donned suitable clothing. In every sense of the word, when Joseph's great hour came, he was ready. He was ready. God has prepared him through all of those trials. He passed Several tests. Breathtaking indeed in the dungeon in the morning in the palace by night. A condemned slave when the day begun. The Lord of all Egypt at the day's end. So he is brought, <clears throat> he is brought before Pharaoh. And I'd like to make it short. So he comes and Pharaoh says, look, I had two dreams. I don't know the interpretation. Do you? What did Joseph say? He says, no, I can't. Let's read it. Uh, Genesis 41. And Joseph, verse 16. And Joseph answered, answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. Notice something. He would not put himself that he is so great. And he is such uh, an astrologer or whatever they, they thought of him. He said, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. That's what he was looking for. God shall give Pharaoh. It's not in me. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood. And he, he gives him the, the dreams. <clears throat> so when Joseph listened to the dreams, he tells him right away. He says, Pharaoh, look, this is very simple. God has a plan. He is going to bless the land of Egypt for seven consecutive years. So this land will produce so much corn. Actually, when the Bible says corn, don't think about real corn. Corn in the Bible means grain. It, it, it's addressing to wheat and barley, but it, it doesn't mean necessarily literal corn, what we take it today, okay? So he says, you will have so much corn, and the idea is that the fifth part of the harvest, you appoint someone to supervise this work and you save it during those seven plenteous years. And he was listening. And then Pharaoh got so enthusiastic, says, wow, we are going to be rich. And then Joseph says, and those kind, skinny cows, it means then will come seven years of famine. So in order that your people would be saved, you need to make this plan. Now he was listening. Pharaoh could have said, oh, thank you, Joseph. Now you can go back to your dungeon. Thank you. Thank you for the interpretation. Did he behave like that? He didn't have to entrust him as the prime minister of the most powerful empire at that time. He was listening. He was looking at his advisor. He was looking at his wise men and his magicians. And he said, if there is any one of you that, that can handle, that can manage this project? And we said, no. We can see that there is a supernatural power. We can see that there is an almighty God that's working through this young Hebrew slave. And Pharaoh says, I appoint you. He looked at this moment, at this moment, right now, I appoint you the prime minister of Egypt. Now, when, when Carlisle Behane says, in the dungeon in the morning and in, by the evening in the palace, did Joseph think that he will go to the palace and never come back to the dungeon? He didn't have a clue. But God had a plan. Bro uh, brethren, God has a plan for you and a plan for me. We don't know it. But God knows it. And the final what I want to mention. It comes the power test. So far he was diligent. He was faithful. Now he is entrusted with power. He is second. He puts a, 
a golden chain around his neck. He puts his signet into his finger. He says, he puts a, a, a new robe on, on Joseph and he gives him the second chariot. And he says, you are second after me, the Lord of Egypt. Every knee, everyone should listen to you. Did he recall some of his dreams from Canaan? They are coming true. Very much so. So now when, look, when you talk about power, we, we say, well, this is bad. But you know what? Most of the people, they pass some other tests, but they can't pass the test of success. They can't pass the test of power. There is a saying, you give someone money and power, and then you will see the real character. I have traveled before in Europe a lot, so I, I know some people from before, before they moved to certain countries. They were different. When they start to make more money, and they got some power, some stability, they would not talk with you. <laughs> they changed. And now they, they, they no, no, let me ask you, is power bad? Actually, let me tell you, this might surprise. Power is a gift from God. Power is not wrong. The only thing what is wrong, for which purpose the power is used. Now, the power which was given to Joseph was given that he would fill out his pockets with money and become rich. The Lord of Egypt, was that the main purpose? Wrong. The main purpose... He was supposed to be the basket bread of his people and the people of Egypt. He was supposed to be that savior in a way to protect that land and that area of the famine which is going to come. That power was to serve others. You know when Pilate is turned to Christ and said, well, do you know that I have power to release you or to crucify? What did Jesus tell him? You would have known that they had, had that power. That power is given you from where? From above. So brethren, all the power we have, it's given from above. But, but the problem is how we handle it. I, I, like this, uh, I, I like this experience. One minister in his years, you know, in the beginning when he was in a way humble, he said, he used to say, when somebody would make a compliment, say, well, very good, you know, he would say, all God, all God. So, <laughs> one time he finished his sermon, and he, as, as he was coming out, one of the fellows came to him and he said, that was good, brother, that was good. And he said the same, he had the same, he said, all God, brother. And, and that gentleman said, uh, it, it wasn't so good. <laughs> So, here we are. There are trials that are tests, not punishments. There are trials of faith, of patience, of fortitude, not rods of scourge, to scourge us for being particularly wicked. God's people are tried, tested, trained, developed, shaped for the work into which at length he will fit them. He has told us that whom the Lord loveth, he chastises. So God was preparing Joseph for years, three years in jail. Now let me ask you something. He was three years in jail. He was 30 years old when he becomes the vice president of Egypt. How, was, how old was Jesus when he started his ministry? 30 years old, thank you. Uh, how, uh, how many days was Christ in the tomb? Three days. And the first day of the week, he went first to the Father. In prison in the morning, by the evening, in the palace. Do you see parallels in this type of Christ, which is Joseph? I'd like to conclude. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 223, one paragraph, it says, 
There are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon, upon the development of character. Nothing with which we have to do is really small. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us for greater trusts. By adherence to principle and the transactions of ordinary life, the mind becomes accustomed to hold the claims of duty above those of pleasure and inclination. Minds thus disciplined are not wavering between right and wrong, like the reed trembling in the wind. They are, they are loyal to duty because they have trained themselves to habits of fidelity and truth. By faithfulness in that which is least, they acquire strength to be faithful in greater matters. As, as I already said, Joseph is a type of Christ. It's very interesting. Jesus came from the Father. Joseph came from the Father to see his brothers. Jesus became a servant. Joseph was sold as a slave, as a servant to those people. Jesus was three days in the grave. Joseph was Three, day, three years in, in, in the dungeon. Now the last one. Joseph was in between two prisoners. One was released to live. The other one was sentenced to die. Jesus Christ was in between two prisoners. One was supposed to live and the other one died. Do you see the, the, the parallel? Joseph asked the butler to remember him and he forgot him. The thief on the cross asked Jesus, remember me when you are in paradise. Did Christ forget the thief? Did Christ forget anyone? Brethren, this is my word for you this morning. Christ will never forget you. Remember this, Christ will never forget you. May the Lord bless us. Amen.